In a previous video, we saw that when you take a prism and shoot a ray of light, the ray of light undergoes a deviation. It undergoes a deviation, and this deviation has a minimum value. In this video, we're going to figure out exactly what that minimum value of this deviation is. To figure this out, let's name some angles. Let's call this incident angle as I. The ray of light got refracted, so let's call this angle as R. We'll call it as R1. Remember, our angles are always with respect to the normal. Similarly, over here, again, there's an incident angle. We'll call this angle as R2. We'll call the angles inside the prism as R. So let's call this angle as R2. And finally, the ray of light is emerging out. And we'll call that angle as the angle of emergence. We'll call that angle as E. So we'll call this angle as E. Now, if you, if you see carefully, we'll see that the ray of light is deviated twice. Once over here, second time over here. Over here, notice that this was the initial direction and the ray of light has bent downwards. So this angle will represent the first angle of deviation, D1, let's call that. And similarly over here, the ray of light was going this way, but again, it got deviated downwards. And so this will be the second angle of deviation. Let's call that as D2. So let's call this angle as D2. And so our total deviation D now becomes D1 plus D2. So D, the total deviation becomes D1 plus D2. And we need to simplify this. Our first step will be to try and put D1 and D2 in terms of these angles, I, R1, R2, and E. Let's see how we can do that. If you look over here, we can see that this angle is the same as this total angle. I hope you can see that. This total angle. Because they're vertically opposite. And therefore, we can see that D1 is I minus R1. So D1 is I minus, minus R1. Similarly, what is D2 equal to? Again, if you look at this carefully, we can figure this out. If you see this carefully, we can see that this angle is the same as this angle. So let me mark that. This is the same as this angle. They're both same because of, again, vertically opposite angles. But this total angle is E, and so D2 is E minus R2. So let's write that down. This will be E minus minus R2. And so now we can write our angle of deviation as angle I plus angle E minus, I'm gonna take the minus common, minus R1 plus R2. Now we cannot call this as our final equation for deviation because if you look carefully, R1 is something we can calculate by using Snell's law, by applying Snell's law over here. If you know I, we can calculate R1. Similarly, R2, well, that can be calculated once we know R1 by doing some geometry over here. And similarly, once we know R2, E can be calculated again by applying Snell's law. And so these are numbers that can be calculated. So this is not the final equation yet. So we need to get rid of them. The first thing we'll get rid of is R1 and R2. They're a little bit easy to do that. And to do that, we have to concentrate on this triangle. Look at this triangle. If you look at this triangle carefully, we can figure out some kind of relationship between A, R1, and R2. I want you to pause the video for a while and see if you can try this on yourself. All right, let's see. Well, what we'll do is we'll say the ang three angles of a triangle should add up and give us 180 degrees. So angle A, plus this angle over here. Well, what's that angle equal to? Well, if you look carefully, this whole angle is 90 degrees because this is a normal, this is a perpendicular drawn, right? So this is R1, therefore this must be 90 minus R1. So that is 90 minus R1. And similarly, this angle, that is 90 minus R2, plus 90 minus R2, that should equal 180 degrees. Now, 90 plus 90 is 180, that cancels, and so what we see is that A should be equal to R1 plus R2. That is the relationship that we get between R1 and R2 and A. And so notice, we can now substitute this directly over here, and our equation becomes D equals I plus E, 
plus E minus minus A. All right, one more thing we might have to do is eliminate E. And guess what? That turns out to be the most tedious part, not the hardest part, but the tedious part of this derivation. Because if we look carefully, you, you can write E in terms of R2 by using Snell's law. And then by using this equation, R2 can be written in terms of R1. And then again, by using Snell's law, R1 can be written in terms of I. So if you think carefully, E is actually a number that only depends on I. And if you were to apply that, you know what you'll end up with? We'll get this scary looking equation. It only looks scary, but it's not really. And don't worry, we're not gonna analyze that, don't worry at all. But these signs and sign inverses are coming all because of Snell's law, and this whole giant thing is actually E, if you look carefully. And you can see that the only thing E depends on is the angle of incidence I. So if we were to use this equation, if you were to look at this equation, we finally got what we want. We have angle of deviation. It only depends on the angle of incidence I. And remember, our goal is to figure out when this value becomes minimum. And so now we have to ask a mathematical question. How do you figure out in a given equation when the value of D becomes minimum? And it turns out we have to use calculus for that. It turns out that if you can differentiate this equation, then we can figure out what the minimum value is. And you can see that's absolutely nightmares to differentiate this particular equation. So this would be the logical step to do if you are doing it mathematically, but since it's so tedious, we are not going to do that. We're gonna take a slightly different approach that won't require any calculus. So we will plot a graph of D versus I, and then we'll try to figure out the minimum value directly from the graph. Of course, we have, you might be wondering, well, how do we draw a graph of this? Manually drawing would, that, would be tedious. Well, we can use computers to draw a graph for us. And that graph pretty much looks like this graph. You can see that as the angle of incidence increases, the deviation actually decreases, and then hits a minimum, and then increases again. So we are interested in what that minimum value is. And uh, the sh exact shape of this graph might vary a little bit depending upon what values of n and a we choose. So don't worry too much about the, how the graph exactly looks like. But we're interested in that minimum value. So how do we figure this out? The key is to understand this. If you take up any particular value of deviation, so let's say you take this particular value of deviation, what you find is that that deviation can be obtained for two values of i. Can you see that? We can obtain that for two values. So for example, for this value of i and for these, this value of i. So these two values of incidences gives you the same value of d. Why is that happening? Why are we getting the same value of deviation for two values of i? To see why, let's bring back our prism. So here it is. It's pretty much the same thing, but we're taking an example. Let's say the angle of incidence was, I don't know, maybe 20 degrees. And let's say we calculate the angle of emergence. It turns out to be 50 degrees. Now the deviation, you can see this is the incident direction. This is the emergent direction. So this is the angle of deviation. So we will get some value of deviation. Let's say that is D. And let's say this is that angle 20 degrees. Now, what if we were to incident the same ray backwards? Meaning we made this as our incident ray, and so this would be our new angle of incidence. Well, if you think carefully, geometry and Snell's law doesn't care about the direction of the incident ray. We would end up with the same result. And it's for that reason we can argue now the ray of light will just trace backward. And so then this would be the emergent ray, and this would be the emergent angle. So now notice this is the incident direction, this is the emergent direction. So this would be our new angle of deviation. But guess what? This angle is the same as this angle. Which means for 50 degrees incidence, we get the same deviation as what we got for 20 degrees incidence. So we can think of it as if one of these angle is what we call as I, then the other angle at which we get the same deviation is the angle E. Hopefully that makes sense. But you may be wondering, well, what's the big deal? So for two angles of incidences, we get the same deviation. Why should we care about that? Well, because if you look now at the minimum value of deviation, if you look at this case, when this value of deviation is minimum, so I'm just gonna call it M for minimum, we see that that happens only at one one particular angle of incidences and not two. What could that mean? I want you to pause the video and just think about this for a while. What could that mean? Well, that could only mean one thing.
that at this point, the angle of incidence must be equal to the angle of emergence. I mean, think about it. If they were not equal to each other at this point, then we would have still gotten two values at which the deviation should have been same, just like what we had over here. The very fact that there is only one value gives us the clue that at minimum deviation, when the angle of uh, deviation is minimum, these two have to be equal to each other. And that's the clue that we need to solve this without doing any calculus. So let's go back to our equations. Here it is, I've rearranged a little bit to make more space. And so what we found is that when, when our angle of deviation hits the minimum value, the angle of incidence has to be equal to the angle of emergence. And let's call that special angle, let's call that as I naught. And if you think carefully, if these two angles are equal to each other, then from Snell's law we can argue when these two angles must be equal to each other. Think about that for a while. So that also means that R1 should be equal to R2. Let's call that angle as R0. So let's make some space. And what I love about this approach is we don't have to look at the big scary equation at all. All right, so here is the situation that I've drawn at minimum. And so the next step would probably be, well, we can just now go ahead and substitute this over here. Let's see what happens. So now D becomes D minimum. So we get at minimum deviation, we get I plus E, but they're both equal to I naught. So we can say that's equal to two I naught, two I naught minus A. But we still haven't found what our minimum deviation is because we don't know what I naught is. We still don't know. But we have another equation. So maybe we can go ahead and substitute that. So the next thing we can do is we could say, well, A equals R1 plus R2, so that's two R naught, two R naught. And now here comes the tricky thing. What do you think we should do next? I mean, we still have a lot of variables. R naught and I naught are variables. We don't want them in our equations. What do you think we should do next to figure out exactly what D minimum is? I want you to pause the video and think about this. Well, we can connect I naught and R naught by using Snell's law over here, and that is the last step for us. So it's not very obvious, a little tricky, but that's what we'll do. So we'll connect. So we'll apply Snell's law at this point. So let's see where we do that. Okay, we'll do that here itself. So if we apply Snell's law, we can say one times sine I naught, which is the same as sine I naught. That should be equal to n times sine R naught. n times sine R naught. And now we can find what I naught is from this equation. We'll do this mentally. What is I naught equal to? Well, we'll add A on both sides. So we'll get D minimum plus A, and we'll divide by two. So if you look carefully, we'll get A, A plus D minimum, plus D minimum, divided by two. Can you see that? That is I naught. And that equals N times sine of R naught. Well, R naught is A divided by two. And if you look at this equation carefully, that is the final equation. And notice in this equation, we know what A is, we know what N is, that means we can calculate what the minimum deviation is. Of course, it's, it's not very easy calculation, but you can calculate. So to summarize, in this derivation, the first thing we do is we write down the angle of deviation in terms of the angle of incidence and the angle of emergence. And then we see that the deviation becomes minimum. This is the key takeaway that the angle of incidence equals the angle of emergence. And then we eventually substitute, that's what we come over here, and we use Snell's law to finally get this expression. And one last super quick thing is that in a previous video, we saw this 22 degrees halo around the sun is caused sometimes due to the suspended ice crystals acting like a prism. But why is it 22 degrees? Well, because these prisms have a minimum deviation angle of 22 degrees. And we can test that. You see, we know the refractive index of these prisms. They're ice crystals, so that's pretty much water. Then we also found that these ice crystals have an A value of about 60 degrees. And if you plug that in, you'll actually see that the minimum deviation value is roughly around 22 degrees. That is amazing if you think about it. And that's the whole reason we get a 22 degrees halo.